Where'd Terry go? He just took off. Uh, He's still here. Trying to, He's trying playing to with his bandsaw in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, Terry's like, hold on real quick. I got to saw something. Yeah. Anyway, we're okay, live. Okay, okay, okay. We're live. We're here. We're at a show, I think. We yeah, live. There's a lot of people here, too, it looks like. Yeah, well, we're people live. Are, people are listening. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to stiffen up, huh? Yeah. We're gonna, you're going to have to, <laughs> you know, Terry. You might I know. Not- I, tasty beverage of some kind there. it was pretty <laughs> loose before we went live so yeah now it's happens. it that's it now it's over now it's totally stiff and as a matter of fact let's kick this show off right It's not as good as Lund. Well, I mean, we know it's not what as is? good as nothing is as good as Andy Lund playing that intro song. But whatever. I mean, we're we're back though. We're back. We're on a show. We're live here. Taylor Guitars, Prime Time, Episode ninety nine. Mike, we've done ninety nine things. Ninety nine things have been done. Well, ninety eight things wow. were done. We're doing wow. the ninety ninth now. Ninety nine bottles of beer in the wall. Ninety nine problems and oh, that was my next. Ninety nine luff balloons. Ninety. I was gonna. <laughs> I was gonna noin noin just say that luff balloons. <laughs> That's good. I like Man, that. people came to join in. Ninety nine in the shade. Yes, no. I just went all Bon Jovi on you. <clears throat> wow. wow, John Bon Jovi. Yes, I got a funny story about John Bon Jovi. So you know, my dad. We were flying somewhere once a uh, long time ago. And my brother had one of those like yellow Sony Walkman, right? Ah, the waterproof one. Yeah. And my dad was, uh, he was the guy who, who would always get like headphone volume when he would talk. Right. So he'd have his headphones on and he'd be like, I'm listening to music. Like when he would talk, right. It was great. So I believe we were on a plane and my, my dad was like to my brother, Jim, what are you listening to? Let me listen. And so he puts the headphones on and they're the kind that like stick in your ears. So they were really high fidelity, remember? Mm -hmm. And so my dad's like, this is good. What is this? And he's like, it's Bon Jovi. And my dad, (laughs) my dad yells, iron jokely. And that was it. That's my story. Oh, man. That's all right. That was a long Ooh, way to get iron there. Jokely? I don't know. I mean, headphone wow. ears. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Has that ever wow. happened? That's a good interpretation. Iron Jokely. It's a that's, new band name. That's every time I hear the, the name Bon Jovi, I say Iron Jokely out loud. So, sounds like, kind of like a, you know, a, a, a little uh, parody <laughs> of a Black Sabbath band. Iron there you go. Jokely. Okay. Yeah, that I am Iron Jokely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like the Cookie Monster voice. I yeah, Cookie that. Monster voice is good. <laughs> welcome back. Welcome back. Terry Myers. We got Terry Myers back on the show. Ah, I should have done research. We, You were on one of the very early episodes, man. It was like in the heart of 2020. You did us a favor and jumped on the show from the same place you're located right now. I believe you may have had a bandsaw and behind you at that time as well. Yeah, probably. But, you know, welcome back to the show, Terry. We're stoked to have you here. Tonight's show is about do old guitars really sound better. It's going to be fun to talk about this. Mike, how you doing? I'm doing okay. How about you? Are you over there now? <clears throat> so just because you put a Yankees shirt on, this is how hey, we communicate? This is how we communicate. Well, I mean, let's be honest. You know, truly baseball season starts in less than 48 hours so truly baseball season starts the day after the super bowl well uh, actually truly baseball starts the minute pitchers and catchers show up we got to give that little weak breathing room uh, i mean gabe you got uh, you got you got clothing <laughs> fan <laughs> gabe no it's just the best way to eat them <clears throat> how are you doing gabe i'm i'm good I mean, it's a busy week. I'm uh, a few days away from spring break, and uh, my family are traveling to Alaska. 
sprung break where you, what what made you go want to go to alaska besides it's alaska and it'd be nice to go there alaska is great um we my wife's sister and her family live there we've got a niece we have not yet met and we keep promising the girls we're gonna take them so here we go are you flying there or yeah. are you going to take we're a boat? teleporting uh yeah we're flying we're flying uh are you it, doing the iditarod on the way there <laughs> now we might we might do dog sleds while we're there we're gonna try oh this is interesting uh, the touchy subject is what airlines are you flying uh we're delta on the way there okay american on the way back oh sorry much that's just how no, it worked that's out. much better uh i'm a fan of american well all yeah. right yeah you you're an American guy? That's American fine guy. if you're stuck there. Yeah, that's fine. I'm a Delta guy. That's fine. I just was wondering if that were weren't there some issues with Alaska Airlines or something like that? Yeah, yeah. the part of the plane fell off. I'm glad I'm it not. It wasn't the airline as much as it was the manufacturer. <laughs> Boeing, right? Not, I, I am flying on a Boeing, but not the ones that keep falling apart. It's hard like not there. to fly on a Boeing aircraft. That's what yeah, that's true. They make airplanes. There's like yeah. two companies that make larger bodied airplanes, Boeing and Airbus. That's kind of your only choice. <laughs> so Airbus is a bit more reliable right now. Right now. Right now, yeah. Didn't used to be. Studies show that if you had enough, <laughs> enough thrust. It's a study show. A studies show if you had enough thrust, you could just fly there on Terry's custom amp. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's oh, true. yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that one. And that probably more comfortable, great. too, with all that padding. <laughs> that's right. That's true. All right. All right. All right. All right. It's been six minutes and 47 seconds and we haven't gotten into the show yet. Uh, Terry, welcome back. Mike, Gabe, it's great to see you. You guys know the deal, right? Uh, let's keep the feed clean. We don't want Gabe to have to put you in timeout for saying something out of line or derogatory. Uh, we got no hate uh, this week. So <clears throat> no hug your haters. See, we didn't get hate because my mom is watching the show and she's excited that we're doing this on her pseudo regular again. Um, so tonight's episode, of course, do old guitars really sound better? I'm super excited about that. Episode 99. It is pretty crazy that it, we've done this a lot. Mike, Gabe, you've been part of this for a while. It, it's I'm pretty impressed at us. All right. That's all. Mm -hmm. next, next move to the next thing all right let's go into our segment album the album of the month album of the month let's go with terry terry what have you been listening to recently one you just got to pick one record oh, oh man just do you not listen record, to music huh? you know it's it's funny because i don't my wife always talks about that she goes for a guy who plays all the time you don't listen to music much. Why is that? I said, well, I go, because most of it's been beat to death and I don't need to hear it for the, you know, 1,000th time. You know, what? you know what? That's spoken by a true rock star or like a true rock star. You know what I mean? So, Terry. But, but if I'm going to go for something, I, I typically go, I mean, I'm a Detroit guy. And although, you know, I'm kind of a, a rocker when it comes to playing guitar, I'm my thing is really listening to uh, old soul, R&B, yeah. funk. That's that's kind of where my heart lives. And so I'll uh, I'll always gravitate to that on a playlist where I get this mix of all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's what I grew up with, mm -hmm. you know, as well as the rock thing, you know, Detroit you know, you can't that that soul R and B and funk stuff just that just hits me hard. So you don't really have you're just listening to playlists. I listen to playlists that had just mixes go. up all those flavors right there, you know, and then I can be in my garage, you know, working on a guitar and kind of grooving and moving all by myself. I could see Terry kind of like dancing around. Hey, you know, dan yeah. <laughs> Was that Billy Idol yeah. <laughs> dancing with myself? There you go. Dance with yourself. All right, Gabe, what are you listening to, man? What's your album of the month? Uh, I mean, honestly, the thing I've probably been listening to most is like the Bluey soundtrack or something because because of the kids. But uh, I am super into, personally right now, A List of Demands by Chemist Mayfield. Oh. Yeah. I've I've had that on, on kind of hot rotation in the car 
when I'm alone, not with the kids, but alone. Yes. Hot rotation. Yeah. That's fantastic. Mike, do you have anything in hot rotation? I have something in hot rotation. Yes. What is it? Uh, well, I normally would show an album, but this one isn't available on vinyl. So, uh, it's a band that Jay, you've probably heard of. Maybe nobody in the feed has heard of, and definitely the other two guys in the other two windows have not heard of. And it's an artist called Kim Dracula. And uh-huh. uh, that's such a good name, though. It is. Well, it's taken from a Deftone song. Um, and they named the band after the Deftone song. Um, name of the album is called The Gradual Decline of Morale. And uh, the singer, who I guess is Kim, Uh, is a guy from New Zealand who through Australia built up this whole following now. And it's the best way I could describe it for anybody, which nobody will listen to this by the time I'm done describing it. It's if you took corn, Marilyn Manson, Mr. Bungle, faith, no more and clown core and put it all in a blender and then poured it out and then added some trap kit rap. It's, it's all in one song. (laughs) <laughs> wow that sounds awesome man it's it's actually great they're playing the observatory here on friday so i'm gonna go <laughs> what, about, uh, what about you jay what's on what's on hot rotation hot rotation or oh, hot rotation hot, casa de parking i you know i'm all over the place with music you guys know this you know i'm a big hip-hop fan i'm a big metal fan i'm a electronic music fan uh Mm, probably hot rotation right now would be boy mm, either Nas magic three or i'm gonna say two uh, the justin timberlake record i was really interested in hearing what he was going to do if he was progressing into i'm growing out of justin timberlake kind of and then he came back it's really phenomenal and the players that are on it some of the guitar players we work with are on it it's 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 fantastic However, there's another record that I've been listening to. Oh, Snooze. Oh, I know what that means. <clears throat> Rick anyway, also grew out of Justin Timberlake. He grew out of Justin Timberlake. That's cool. But uh, Hate Beak? Mike, have you heard about Hate Beak? So you guys know that I have a 35-year-old Amazon blue phone. I know what you're about to of- say. Yes. And it was a guy that did Hate Breed covers with a parrot singing. So it's a metal covers with a parrot singing and then he did another record and it was a like metal greatest hit so it was, there's a there's a song called roost in peace oh it's so good so just imagine imagine heavy metal with a <laughs> parrot singing all right should we move on that's it that's, was that snoozy actually for for people that are looking for animal singers of metal bands there's another band jay i know that you know this one it's called <laughs> caninus canine uh, yeah <laughs> that was that was one that kind of started it all. And it's just a dog growling over <laughs> metal riffs. It's fantastic. Ah, all I right. Like, I like that there might be people looking for animal versions of. <laughs> you never know. That's. I'm sure that's an interesting subset. It'd be even better if the birds sang better than the original vocalists. <laughs> That would be awesome. All right. Before we talk to Terry and get this conversation started, Talking everybody, I know I know you guys, uh, hopefully you guys, uh, Jay likes his birds singing. I do. I do. I love it. Um, you guys know that we dropped a podcast with Bob and Kurt called American Dreamers, 50 Years of Taylor Guitars. The second episode dropped today. I'll put some links in the, in the comments a little bit later, but if you're on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Amazon or Deezer or anywhere you listen to podcasts, you can hear it, or you can go to our, our website and you can hear it there. Uh, if you're into watching the video, I'll put that link on here. It's it's on our website, but uh, um, the second episode dropped today, Gabe, you've been working on these. Um, they're just getting better, aren't they? I know we're only two into the public, but they're just getting better. The stories are getting deeper and more fun. And in the second episode, there's a lot of laughing. Yeah, it's, it's great. Uh, I'm excited to see where it takes us. This is the my new favorite comment. <laughs> I just turned on hate beak. I <laughs> scared my dog to death. Ron, it's the worst, isn't it? It's so good. Uh, it's my great. buddy who told me about it said, how long did you last? And and he was expecting me to say like 15 so seconds. And uh, I said, you know what? I listened to every single song. Just just I had to torture myself with hate beak. It's, it's not very good. Rotation. 
it's, it's in, in hot, hot rotation. rotation. It's in beak rotation. Terry Myers, man, oh man, Terry, back to the show. Terry, for those of you who don't know Terry Myers, Terry, what employee number were you? Like three? I, I, uh, no, no, it's hard. Um, it's hard to remember exactly, but it's like 13 to 15, right? Right there. Really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like 13 thir- to 15. Okay, so 13, how many 15, years? 15, right in there. How many years have you been here? 32, 33? Uh, 36. Oh, 36. Um, oh, over 36. Yeah, over 36. And we, so it's our 50th year. Yeah. As we know. Uh, yep. And Terry has been here, not all 36. Have you? No. Like, no, no. no. I, well, I was gone for about eight months. Yeah. So whatever. Right. So you left, so, then you came back. Yeah, it was and what, a short little stint. What is your title? I don't think we have a title. What is uh, your title? You know, there it, it's there really isn't a title. It's like kind of a projects guy <laughs> yeah. because so there's so many different things that come my way <laughs> that you know I'm just a projects guy. So and whatever whatever the hot button is at the moment, or something that needs to be worked on or addressed at the moment. Yeah, you know, you've got all these years of experience, so there's a lot of different things that you understand and have history with, and yeah. So sometimes you can solve things pretty fast that might take longer because it's like, oh, I remember we went through this type yeah. of thing. So it, it was old really, man time. Old man time. That's that's for sure. When when Mike, Gabe, and I were talking about doing this episode, so this episode stems from the last episode we had. We had Bob Taylor on. <clears throat> and we had a discussion about there was a question that came up about wood aging over time, maturing over time. And there's one one little thing that Bob said was keep one of your guitars. It's OK to buy and sell and do the thing and keep buying new and whatever. But he said, if you don't just grab one and keep it and hold on to it for a few years, you're never going to know what that guitar sounds like in 15 years or 20 years or 25 yeah. years. Right. So, I, you know. It was just a perfect episode to come in and talk about guitars that age, right? So the question is, we always get that. You get a lot of people out there that are talking about, do old guitars sound better? Are they better? Were they built better? Et cetera, et cetera. So Terry, to us, Mike and I, right out of the gate, we're like, Terry Myers would be perfect for this. <clears throat> You're a part of our product development team in ways you've helped innovate how our guitars are set up uh i'll be sure if i'm ever mm-hmm. sending a guitar to an artist it goes through terry's hands first um he he can put a little extra sauce on these things don't don't get me wrong we have wonderful techs all over the building but terry it, it what is it about you and what got you started with guitars that make it i mean Am I wrong, guys? When a guitar goes through Terry's hands, it's something special. It goes out a boy and comes back a man. Right. Oh. You know, <laughs> I like that. It, it, That's funny. You know, you, That's you, funny. I've seen you work magic with, you know, guys in the office and like, well, this thing had, you know, two single coil pickups and it comes up with three humbuckers and a Bigsby and like... <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, it comes back, it, it leaves a lesser guitar and comes back a superior model. <laughs> and and it's not just acoustic. I mean, Terry, no, no, not at all. <laughs> How many guitars do you have? Well, superior is relative. You know, I have, a, I have 120 <laughs> guitars. You know, the first time we did that. I'm, I'm an addict, you know, of the worst kind. The first time we had you on the From the Factory podcast, which is our audio podcast, you only had 91 guitars. So you've increased your well, collection. That was a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you have 120 guitars, and and so it, it makes me think that you're a subject matter expert in this. Well, you know, it's like I'm the whole deal. I'm a I'm a builder. I work in manufacturing. I've worked in retail. I've you know I, I've done the whole thing. I I'm a pro player. I play you know shows. I travel all over the U.S. doing that, and so it's kind of. Uh, it's just one stop shopping. You know, I've done every avenue of the whole thing from the building of a guitar all the way to a stage. So there's a depth of understanding that comes with that. 
when you have that much background and you've covered every base, you know, from it, from retail to manufacturing to playing on a stage to to the consumer, you know, with acoustics and electrics. I mean, really, Terry, you do magic on guitars. So it couldn't have been a better opportunity to have you jump on this show. So I kind of want, I want to dive right into the conversation. <clears throat> I have a, a few questions. Uh, we're going to start off with one question and then we're going to go into Gabe actually has some beautiful guitars and we're going to talk about those guitars and listen to watch a few video clips, uh, demos of guitars. And then we're going to oh, answer a few. Not, more. not as many as Terry has. Not as many as Terry. Yeah. How many guitars do you have, Gabe? Uh, I mean, comparatively, I'm putting up like rookie numbers, like in the 30s. Well, that's a good starter pack. Yeah, that's real. <laughs> that's respectable. There, <laughs> that's better than most, right there. I applaud you for that one. <laughs> I've got, I've, I've got, you know, I think, I, 13 or 15 Taylors. I can't remember. I mean, I'm a lot older than you, so you're gonna catch up. I, I, I think I look good. older than you, but you know. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I've yeah. aged more poorly, but yeah, I mean, really, we all look older than Terry. Terry's like the youngest at heart ever. Okay, I'm okay. pretty sure Terry can fix that. Terry can fix anything. <laughs> Terry. Terry he can. can. He can <laughs> fix that. All right, so I have a question for all three of you. We'll start with Terry answering this thing, and then we'll go around to Mike and Gabe. Um, what factors contribute? to the perception that old guitars sound better than new ones? Is it a perception? Anyone can start. I'll start. Okay. <laughs> it's a perception. Um, because there's so many factors involved. People say, oh, that guitar is old, ergo, it sounds better. That's not necessarily the case. Old could just be old. Just like just because it's old doesn't mean it's vintage. It could just be old. It depends on the construction. It depends on the uh, <coughs> the woods that were used, where those woods were sourced from originally. Uh, you know, why do Stradivarius violins? Why do they command so much money? Because that was made from trees that were like a thousand years old. You know, like that. It are the these are the kind of things that give the perception that old is better, but that's not necessarily what you're holding in your hands. Right. And let's talk about the difference between subjective and objective. There you okay? go. So you're defining, right? So subjective is something that you like. Objective is that it's true and there's no argument, right? Essentially at its core. Now you can have an older sounding guitar that somebody loves and covets and you hate it. That's true. So let's think about that too. That's why it's a perception that older is instantly better. I think we could say older is good, you know, for the most part. And then you have to break it down by, well, where are the biggest differences? Because you hear more of that in acoustic guitar than you do in electric guitar in a lot of ways. And when I say that, it doesn't mean that there aren't differences between old electric guitars and new electric guitars. Sure. But Jay, you and I were talking about this earlier. A 1959 Les Paul versus a 2019 Les Paul. People say, oh, the 59's got to be better. It's got to sound better. It must sound better. Is it because it's old? <laughs> or is it because the pickups that are in there are doing the heavy lifting and they were wound in a certain way at a certain time? You know, it's or or did Terry Myers set it up? Oh, well, he did, of course. You know, you know what I mean? No, but but true. I mean, <laughs> you can get a yes. guitar that's just it's just poorly set up and it's very hard to play. And so you're not going to get the most out of it. Sometimes exactly. it's it not going to sound it. great. And that's with any guitar yeah. for that matter. A poorly set up guitar is going to sound terrible no matter how no matter what it is, whether Correct. it's a 10 weeks old or 100 years old. But again, it's not necessarily instant that older sounds better because better is subjective. I love that. I love that reply. T Terry, how do you feel about this? Well, Mike, you did your homework. I like that. That was a, that was <laughs> oh, a good. That you was just a good, got blessed by Terry. That was a good speech right there. I'm, you I'm know, so honored. It's, um, <laughs> you know, everything he said, 
But, you know, there's so many factors that go into each guitar. It's yeah. like, yeah, it's like th there's this whole thing that everything that gets older is better and cooler. And it's like, no, that's not absolutely not true. Just because it got old doesn't mean it's a great guitar. Uh, last week, I worked on uh, five, no, four 59 Les Pauls and one 1960, right? You know, you're talking, a, I don't know, two and a half million dollars in guitars. And of those five guitars, one stood out, one was good, two were cool, and one was, I don't know, I'd row boat with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth a fortune, but... Expensive oars. Nothing yeah. there. Nothing there. It's like you, you've got all these things that happen from, you know, the the old growth wood to newer growth wood, right? To where the where the wood came from in the tree. It's going to sound different depending on where it came from in the tree. That's you know, it's okay. Oh, this wood sounds like this. Oh no, not always. Not always. Where did it come from in the tree? It's, it might it might have more high end. Might be less, might be more resonant, might be less. Older guitars, you know, one of the things is you've got 25% of what makes up a piece of wood is what holds all the moisture. And it takes years for that moisture to wick itself out of that piece of wood, all these little cellular structures, getting all Bill Nye science guy on you. Love it. And, you know, and as time goes by, all those little cells that are giving off and taking moisture, that's about 25% of the, the wood in a guitar. As those empty out, you've, you've got these little cellular chambers within a piece of wood. So theoretically, as a guitar gets older, can it sound better? Can it open up? Can it be more resonant? Yes. Scientifically, yes, it can because the guitar is giving off moisture and moisture in a guitar. It's a good thing, but it's not always the best. Like uh, if you have your guitar in Hawaii, it's going to sound totally different than if you take it to Arizona for two weeks and play it. Right. Because it's going to give up all that water when you're in, when you go to Arizona from Hawaii and it's like, wow, my guitar sounds killer. It never sounded this good before, right? You go back to Hawaii and it's like, I don't think, <laughs> I don't know why this thing sounds so tubby all of a sudden. Well, it took on a bunch of water. Well, as the wood gets old, it stops exchanging that water at the same rate. You know, old saying, uh, once it starts hitting that 10 year mark, sort of like Bob said, keep it around for a while. They do, they loosen up, time goes by. But yeah, that perception of old, there's so many factors from the piece of wood, old growth versus new growth. The moisture it, it takes on, the moisture it gives off, how old is that piece of wood? And the thing I have to explain to people a lot with vintage guitars, because I work on a ton of vintage guitars with a lot of high-end clients and You've got this whole thing where it's supposed to sound a certain way to them. And, and they just can't figure out why this guitar sounds so dull. This is my 54 Strat, man. You know, it's like, well, you can only do so much to that guitar. You set it up, you make it play the best it can, you make it perform the best it can. But here we go. It's like Mother Nature. It's all these little combinations of that piece of wood for the neck, that piece of wood for the body. It all comes together. Sometimes it makes magic. Sometimes it doesn't, period, whether it's an old guitar or a new guitar. You say a guy like some older guy like Robin Trower, you send him 20 strats, he's only going to pick out two that are worth playing to him. The ones that have this nice resonance, this ring acoustically before you even plug it in. Some guitars just have this life to them just due to mother nature, even whether they're new or old. I play a lot of vintage guitars that are 
sorry the the new one on the shelf kills it why that's like when i i you know when i was touring a lot i had this thing like gabe so right after this is perfect segue into gabe your birth year guitar right and we'll go into setting up those guitars and play some clips <clears throat> but terry i i, I i'm always uh I love the idea. I was always like a Les Paul guy. I loved him, right? And then I started getting into like Tele Deluxes, like 75, 74 Tele Deluxe. It took me, when I was touring a, a lot, I, I would go to vintage shops. And I, I believe, I think you guys may know the story. I believe the one that I, the 75 that I ended up buying, or 74 that I ended up buying, <clears throat> I no longer have it. Um, but the 74 I ended up buying, I think I bought from Rich Cachado's shop when he had a, had a guitar store wow. and Rich has been on the show many a times, as you guys know. Um, and anyway, but it took me for ever to find a 75. That was good. I think I bought yeah eight, but, and it was like the eighth one was like, okay, this one's good. Why, why is that? It, you know what you can, you can line up, 10 strats that are made right now, and they're all amazing, right? They're all going to sound a little different. Same yeah. as Les Pauls of you. They're all going to sound different. There's going to be smoking ones in there and maybe some dull, dead-sounding ones. The same thing applies to newer guitars. You know, yeah. to, you can't make this blanket statement that an old one sounds good. I mean, even Joe Walsh will tell you some of them just are worthless. Yeah. Just, think, you know, even if it's a 59, it doesn't make it, it makes it worth a ton of money. It doesn't mean it's a, it's great, a good, great guitar. Great guitar. Yeah. We've heard um, Stradivarius violins brought up a couple times. And one of the other factors I think contributes to people assuming guitars are going to be better because they're old is the, the zeitgeist or the hype. People, you know, Stradivarius violins are famous. And so people assume they're great. There was a couple of years ago, a blind test where they brought in, I don't remember how many, I don't remember what, I don't, I think it might've been just two and two, like two actual Stradivarius violins and two like really high end mm -hmm. builder, um, modern violins and almost to a person like, and then did a blind test, like a thin, like sheer curtain, you know, yeah. you had to be facing you, every sat in the same spot. It was like, you the know, Pepsi it, challenge. It was like the Pepsi challenge and almost to a person, everybody picked the modern violins as better because of personal preferences, because tastes evolve and everybody was, you know, shocked. Um, but so there's a certain amount, I think of that kind of, that kind of hype, like, oh, this specific thing is so great because it's old or the specific um, there's that. And I think in guitars, one of the things we hear a lot is, well, I went into the store and I played, you know, a new, this new guitar and it doesn't sound as good as my blah, blah, blah at home. Well, sure that you, first of all, are accustomed to that guitar. You're, you're, you know, you're used to hearing it in your environment and it's also X amount of years older. So it's broken in and opened up and, had undergone some of the changes Terry is talking about. So like that was a discussion I've had about people or with people a lot right around when, you know, like the first couple of years of V class coming out as people would talk about, well, my, you know, and I still hear it sometimes, you know, my, my X brace 814 CE. Well, and I'm like, well, that's at least five years old. And so you're going into the store and you're playing a brand new one that got made, you know, 30 days ago or whatever versus yours that's at least five years old they're going to sound different like yours is going to have opened up considerably so you just got to sometimes look at the attributes of things and and go okay does this yeah. do i hear this you know the fundamentals that i want to hear and depending on uh just depending on the climate alone yeah depending <laughs> you know, on the i mean yeah. a couple of good examples would be like okay you've got even when eddie van halen came around you know in 78 right you still had all these vintage guitars they were still considered pretty cool at the time 50 strats and and whatnot and here this kid comes along you know and everybody's like i got that tone that tone that tone. i gotta have that tone 
And this is a guy that throws, you know, gets a body from Wayne Charvel and a neck, throws it together. And all of a sudden it's this godlike tone <laughs> that nobody's ever been able to get. Ever. And it's out of, you know, the scrap bodies that he sold to Eddie cheap. Right. And then all the way to like a Leo Kotke. Uh, I remember he, uh, one time he sent me a, an old 510 of his and, uh, and it was dried out really, really bad. It had five big open cracks on the top. The guitar was just destroyed. And uh, I called him up and I go, what do you want me to do with this? He says, just set it up and make it play. He goes, don't humidify it and don't fix the cracks. And I went, okay. Because it he, was awesome. He goes, that guitar sounds amazing. Don't do anything. Just make it play better. I said, okay, I'll dial it all in all dried out like it is so this subjective thing of tone itself right because some of these guys are going to make that guitar sound amazing just with their hands forget yep. the wood forget the science yeah the bone tone yeah yeah get the player in there some of these players are going to make that guitar turn into magic where the yeah. next guy picks it up and it's like this thing sounds horrible right yeah it's like those players who have specifically well there are people who have specifically distinguishable distinguishable tone if you hand i don't know santana whatever he's gonna sound it's like gonna, santana gonna doesn't matter like santana. he's gonna sound like yeah. santana gonna sound like him if you dialed in you know i i was talk about this jay's heard me say this before uh you can you know if you could take a, a les paul and plug it into a, an ac30 and dial it into where it's just ripping and it sounds amazing and then hand it to me and it'll sound like a turd because that's <laughs> not my amp it just it doesn't work for me like yeah. maybe with a gretch but that's about it you know so yeah you know the player is a huge factor in the tone of everything and, and the way you grow accustomed and acoustic guitars too. Yeah. The way you grow accustomed to a particular sound, a particular tone wood, the way you attack it, that, that all yep. plays a factor. You know, it's, it's, it's a huge factor. <clears throat> it's like that story that Tim Godwin, Tim Godwin has been on the show for some of you may know who he is. Some of you who don't, Tim Godwin is our director of artist marketing at Taylor. Uh, he's one of the most tasteful guitar players. I mean, he is an absolute ripper. I mean, you, you, those regulars in the feed over here, you'll know that Tim played in Air Supply. He was a touring guitarist in Air Supply. Like he is a ripping guitarist, right? And he got the opportunity to play uh, the Edge from U2's rig. And, uh, you know, I said, how was it? He was like, it was like a dream come true, but I didn't sound like the edge. That's for sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just, it goes into that, that, that bone tone, that player is really important here. Gabe, that's a perfect segue guys in the feed. Keep your questions coming. We'll try and get back to them as, as soon as we can, but we want to keep this discussion going. So Gabe, I would like you to take a minute and set up the three guitars that we're going to do demos for. We have some demo video clips that Gabe recorded earlier, so the audio is good. Um, then we're going to walk through these. He's going to play three. We're going to do uh, play one guitar. We'll talk about it, play another guitar, talk about it, et cetera, et cetera. And then we'll dive into some more questions. But Gabe, take it away. Tell us about the guitars we're going to hear. Sure. Uh, real simple. I played everything with a mic in the same position. I used a... The green Dunlop 88, because that's a pick people really commonly use uh, um, and figured it was like a good middle of the road. So just to make everything similar. Um, my very first Taylor is one of those guitars just behind me. It's a 2005 514 CE. Basically, everybody from Taylor that's ever played it is like, yep, that's what those are supposed to sound like. It's a it's a really good example of that guitar. I got lucky. It's the first first one, the store I used to work at uh, as a dealer years ago ever uh ever got and it just like i played it for i don't know five seconds and i took it off the wall and went mine and just walked out like took it into the back and i was like nope nobody else gets that one um Ooh. and um there's a 2018 um builder's edition 517 which is my deserted island guitar um i I love my first one and it's got a special place for me, but the, the 517 to, is a really special guitar to me um, that I love. And then the other one is 
a 79 510, um, which is my birth year guitar. I was super stoked to find it. Wow. Um, I sent it in and had a neck reset done at Taylor. It's rad. It's a super cool, really vibey guitar. It sounds sounds great. It's really fun. Nothing like the other two, but also really similar to the other two in some ways, as you'll hear. Um, so yeah, just just super interesting cross section of mahogany tailors. Clearly, I enjoy mahogany. Yes, clearly. It's a little woody, as they say. Yep. Uh, so Gabe, I, I would like to, I don't know, you guys, you guys tell me, I'd like to start old and go new. Yeah. That's fair. Should. Okay. So we're going to start with a 79 510. These clips are about 25 seconds long, and then we'll I, come back. And I apologize for, for my playing, well, <laughs> which is a little rusty. Hey, it's fine. It works. Yeah. It's not we'll Terry. Make, it's, we'll not make, Terry. It's, not Terry. it's not Terry level. Let's just say that. Yeah, it's not Terry level, but we'll, we'll make fun of you later. Do. Off the air. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> On air is fine. Okay. Yeah, okay. 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 So anyway, here's, here's the 79 510. That's a vintage Taylor, as they would say. It is. What if Terry built that Taylor? Were you a Taylor in 79? Nope. It was a little uh, before me. Yep. Darn. Uh the the lowdown I've I've gotten is that Kurt was definitely still making necks at that point. And, and it's likely that both BT and Kurt would have had their hands on it at some point. Absolutely. In 79, yeah. Which makes uh, it even more fun for me. All right. So what makes that guitar so special? Is it special? Let's go to Terry. Terry, is that guitar special? What do we like about that guitar? What don't we like about that guitar? I mean, you can hear that it's loud. It's open. It has some pretty good real round bass on it. So, yeah, it's uh, that's a really good sounding guitar right there. I mean, My, yeah, we're, we're listening to it on video, but it sounds right. good. It's loud. It's open. Uh, all right, Mike, how do you feel about that guitar? Pretty much the same thing Terry said. It does have, it's got projection. You could tell it has projection. It, it definitely has overtones that are kind of awesome. Um, and you could tell it's a more mature sound. Um, that's, I, I guess, probably the best way that I could describe it is, is just, it, it you're a sales up, guy. It grew that up. That was like up. sales guy language. <laughs> yes. It that was, was like sales guy vernacular. <laughs> yeah. It was a mature sound. It was a mature S sound. Says no one who ever hears me speak. It's they're a mature like, sound with an immature player. They're <laughs> like, Jay's not a mature sound. Anyway, all right, let's keep going. Let's do the next one. When was this first 517 built? Rob, it was built in 1979. What is the story? The, five, with the 510 was is 79. 510. What? Uh, yeah, sorry, 510. What? Uh, how did you get that guitar? What was the story there? Um. I actually got it. A a guy put it up in a buy sell trade group, and really, yeah. And I've been searching. I, I, you know, it's one of those things. Like, I'm I'm a mahogany guy. I really like mahogany, and I've just kind of vaguely kept my eyes out for one forever. Um, it was my birthday, actually. Uh, it was like right right around my birthday a couple of years ago, and he he put it up, and I reached out and was like, "Yo, take that down," <laughs> like. <laughs> let's let's talk um it's super cool it's got loads of finish checking um and i mean totally for me it's it's a very classic 70s it's kind of guilty okay mahogany sounding guitar it, it kind of reminds me of a 70s guild you know like in terms of tone like that's it's kind of got that vibe a little bit to me um you know Super nice, skinny neck, little eleven one eleven sixteenths neck. Just Ooh, small. with guy. All right, let's go to the five fourteen then, huh? All right, five fourteen. We're gonna set up the five fourteen. When did you get this guitar? Two thousand five. In two thousand five, you bought it new. Yep. And you kept it R right out of the box. I'll never. I, I don't sell guitars usually. 
Yeah. It's so rare. nineteen rare. a nineteen year old Taylor. If you were watching the last episode, Bob talked <laughs> about at fifteen years there's a big shift. Have you seen a shift from not 15 to 19 yeah significant actually really uh, yeah yeah there's a pretty significant shift that guitar has opened up a lot it's it's a pre it's a cannon it's uh it's way louder than than most cedar top ga's should be i think like um it's really great for finger style um you definitely you, you can hear compression it compresses when you play it um and yeah it's it's a nice guitar all right, let's talk about it. Let's let's listen to it and then we'll talk about it. That's a good sounding guitar, but before we talk about that, by the way, that's how your guitar face looks every time you play guitar. Just, yeah, it's I have a terrible <laughs> guitar face. It's just I want you to know about that. It's so, the worst. Terry, how do we feel about that guitar? A 2005 514 CE. And did you put have your hands on it? 19 uh, two, years ago. Well, 2005. Um, yeah, 2005, I would have been. Uh, I was. I was running the night shift in 2005. Oh, wow. So, yeah, wow. it's hard to... Uh, ask, ask me how long before... I, me and Richard. If y'all don't know this in the comments, I'm I'm an authorized repair tech. I worked in MI retail for a long time. You know how long it was before I did any setup work on that guitar? Hmm. 15 years. <laughs> Even change the That's, strings? No, I change the strings all the time, okay, but okay. I, I didn't... I, I, I kept it in consistent you know relatively consistent humidity and yeah that's it that's a never even right there like finally finally went ahead and took the neck off and did a neck angle adjustment after 15 years that one sounds a lot like the the old one the 510 i mean yeah. number one it's you know that one i think uh, had the cedar top on it yeah yeah, yeah. which is patinaed yeah. and awesome yeah, so they're a little the, and I can hear that it it sounds like mahogany. It's really it's kind of in the ballpark for sure of that five ten, but the five ten projects just a little bit more because it's got a spruce top, a little bigger and, body, a uh, little bigger body, but that five ten is real rich and smooth and probably just a hair less mid range because of the cedar top. Sure, is is what I hear on that one, but yeah, I, I that was one of my. One of, that's one of my favorite tailors we ever made with the mahogany cedars. Ab absolutely. I love it, the it, way they sound just in your lap playing them. Yeah, they're incredible. Uh, Mike, how do you feel about that guitar? You know, the one thing I took away from that, like instantly it was, and I'm sure Terry will agree with this too. It's the sound was indicative of tailors at that time with that sparkle on the high end. Like that's, that's really what, what I was able to notice right away. Cause that was when I was selling tailors, when I was working in retail and actively selling tailor guitars. And that's what, you know, was a selling point was that they are more articulate. They are, they do have a bit of a shimmer on the top. And that's the biggest difference I picked from the 510 to the 514 was a little bit more of that shimmer. But the 510 did sound a little like it projected more uh, overall, but it's also a different body shape too. So we're talking Dreadnought versus a Grand Auditorium. So that's going to play a part. The cedar top's going to play a part. Age will also play a part. Gabe, we have a question about mics. What mic did you use on that guitar? Um, this is <laughs> Jay loves when I get microphone questions because I always say the same thing. It doesn't matter what you use. It matters where you put it. Um, it's true. That is, um, I didn't feel like opening up my my gear case and getting out my Telefunkins. So I used uh, an Audio Technica ATM 450, which is like a very flat $250 microphone. It works great. I've recorded Jason Mraz with those. I remember that. I do. And Andy Powers. That was wild. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I thought that guitar, I think they're beautiful. That's right around the time I started selling Taylors also. Uh, back when I was in retail, um, and uh, the 514 was always 
one of those guitars that was just remarkable. A real dear friend of mine had a 512 that mm-hmm. was also just, Very just popular. what a beautiful instrument that was. He was mainly a fingerstyle player and it just, it was just didn't take a lot for that thing to start moving and it just sounded sweet as pie. And that reminded me a lot of, of, of that guitar, you know, something uh, about spruce or something about cedar and, and mahogany is just a, it's like a match made in heaven. Why do you think Terry? Well, you know, I was just going to say, um, the interesting thing you just mentioned was a five twelve, because a five twelve was one of, was actually the guitar that caused us to take off in Nashville. Bob and I were actually had a conversation about it last week. We were reminiscing a little, but the 512 um, and and the one I'm talking about was a mahogany with a spruce top and it was Nancy Griffith. Mm -hmm. And Nancy Griffith is is the girl that made Nashville take off for us because a lot of the local up and coming people at the time which were Kathy Matea and Susie Bogus and Clint Black and Doug Stone. And, you know, those guys hadn't taken off yet. They were just starting, starting to hit a bit. And, uh, and this is like 1989, you know, a lot of these people had just gotten signed and hadn't had their hits yet, but everybody started getting wind of how Nancy's guitar sounded and more how it recorded. And so everybody started borrowing Nancy's guitar and she was a sweetheart. So she started, yeah, sure. Take it. And so everybody started using her 512 with the mahogany with the spruce top, taking it in the studio and recording with it. And literally in three months, we were just getting orders from Nashville. And one of the things uh, you mentioned about the guitars and general because i used to talk to a lot of the players that were recording on the records every day and the and the engineers and so one of the things they mentioned about was that they loved about taylor's at that time was how well they recorded and how even they were as far as eq they didn't have to They didn't have to mess with them a lot. And one of the key words was the compression on them was perfect for recording. And what that led to was a lot of people started using our guitars live too. Now we had a little more sparkle on our guitars, right? That was one of our, our, a Taylor signature. We had a little more high end, a little sparkle. They weren't quite as boomy, but what that lent itself to was an amazing, the engineers fell in love with them for how easy that was to record and transfer that to live stage. Same thing. They, they, re, they were really good on stage with a whole band behind them driving. So you just, Jay, really, uh, you just picked a ringer to bring up there. I mean, 512, 514, older, 512, 514, 19 years old. <clears throat> I mean, we know that a lot of really great songs were written and recorded on those guitars. Um, yeah. Rob, Rob Cavallo, uh, Rob used Cavallo. One for a long I'm, time. Time of Your Life, Green Day was a 514. <laughs> Another turn in point. <laughs> yeah, Excalibur. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. If Fork stuck in the road. <laughs> oh, sorry. All right. Let's go to the last guitar on our list, and that is a 2018 Builder's Edition 517. I have it figured out. Decides to look at. I have it figured out. Decides to look at camera and oh. (laughs) Okay. What? When Gabe is playing, you say his guitar face is very unique. It's, I I have it figured out. It's like he's looking at his hand, and he's never he's never seen a hand before. So he's. (laughs) 
<laughs> I like that. That's so good. Contemplating that is funny. And then at the end, and at the end, he was like, "What are you doing here, filming?" <laughs> anyway, so sorry. As as we joke, I no. digress. We all watch what our hands are doing when we play guitar, right? That was yeah. me. Like maybe I shouldn't have worn a shirt that says pancakes on it. <laughs> it's true. Hey. Uh, just kidding. Pancakes are amazing. That was phenomenal, in my opinion. That's a new guitar, really. Yeah, well, it's had some years to break in. Gabe, explain that guitar. Why is that guitar so special? Um, that's just a, you know, it's special to me uh, because it it came to it came to me in a really cool way. It was it was kind of a a thank you gift from Taylor. Uh, for some early editing work I did in a, in an extreme rush situation. And uh, that, that I turned around, like, I don't remember, like I don't know, 19 videos in seven days or something stupid, like that needed done really fast. And, and so that, that guitar is also kind of in my career was the first, first time anybody had ever sent me anything like pre-release, which I've gotten like studio monitors and microphones and other things like that since then, which is cool. But that was the first time a company had ever just like handed me something before it ever came out. So I had that guitar for months before it came out. And I had also um, on a shoot with Jay at Southern ground Nashville, um, which was at the time Zach Brown studio played all the prototype grand Pacifics with prototype, like V class bracing and like, you know, six or eight months before, you know, that, before I got that guitar even so, or even, I think it might've been the summer before it was a long time. So nobody had heard about him and I knew this guitar existed and I had it, you know, like knew it was awesome and was super stoked about it. Um, and also just, it's a really good one. It's just a great, it's super fun to play. It plays like a million dollars, like with mediums on it. You can't, it's indistinguishable. The, the, the action between that and, like my my 514 they play the same like light and medium <laughs> strings you can't tell the difference which is like you can tell if humidity changes and it swells a little bit but like other than that like they play the exact same it's so easy to play and i don't know i just love that guitar i'm nuts about it it's a really really good one yeah terry what did you hear when you heard that guitar i mean it, that's a very obvious difference on that one is that uh it's a little bit more even is from the bass to the treble the highs are a little fatter on that there's there's more mid-range on that guitar than there are on the on the older ones there's definitely a, a stronger mid-range which makes the highs a little bit fatter depending on what you want right but it's a little bit more even in that way where the highs are fat and the lows aren't the lows actually aren't quite as strong as on the others but the highs are strong, so it's it's got this really nice balance from low to high. And the projection yeah. is good because mids project really well. Yeah, I love I love that guitar so much. Mike, how did you feel about it? Uh, again, I have to agree with Terry. You know, the the mid range is more pronounced in that one. You know, we've talked about it before with the, with the Grand Pacific shape itself, how Andy engineered that to kind of take out the yeah, it, it sort of the muddiness that's inherent sometimes in a dreadnought style guitar, you know. So because mm -hmm. you're getting more clarity in that low mid, it's bringing the, the the fatter aspects out of the high end as well, and it does sound more even across the entire EQ, more so than the five ten, which you know is going to be a little more bombastic in that low end, uh, as we heard earlier. So, and even, you know, the, the 514 sounded a little chimier, um, right. you know, so it's, you're hearing differences, you know, some of that is, is part and parcel of the shape of the guitar itself. Sure. Right. It is. And, and some of it's the woods, but, you know, does going back, you know, to sum up, like, does the 517 sound not as good as the 510? Right even though the 510 is about 40 years older. You know, it's if you think so, then it right. does. 
<laughs> right. There you go. It's subjective. There yeah. we go. I, so I've got some questions I want to wrap up with to you guys. Terry, I got this one for you. Is there scientific evidence supporting the idea that aging improves the sound of guitars? Well, you know, it's like, what? Well, yeah, you could get into these deep, crazy scientific graphs and all these things, but the fact is, it's a it's a well known thing. It's been around for centuries. That that twenty five percent of a guitar, basically, that I've talked about, you know, you've got you got a, a piece of wood, you got a body that you know you've got. 50% cellulose, 25% lignin, 25% hemicellulose. And this hemicellulose is where that water lives within a guitar, right? So as time goes by, that leaves the guitar. It doesn't return. The guitar gets older and it's not taking on that moisture. It's lost that moisture. So as time goes by, it does open up. It does resonate more, right, as a piece of wood in general. So scientifically, that's just what wood does. Most people that have studied wood know that. And if you even get into these, like uh, I was talking about the old violin makers, right? Right. You even got, you have these stories. I don't know what's true and what's not because you can read a million things. It's like, who wrote it? But you even got these stories of the Stradivarius and all these different violin makers back then where they actually would stew the wood. Really? With this salt, with this salt water kind of compound thing, they concoct it up. But what they were trying to do was get that moisture out of the wood to leave the wood permanently before they even used it. Right? Oh, wow. So that's that right there it can be that's part of the science of wood and these guys going back hundreds of years already understood i want to get that moisture out i wanted to get it to stay out because okay you've got a few factors it makes this more stable piece of wood it's not going to react as much it's going to stay the same more if you can get it to do that when it's a newer piece of wood right it's uh, almost like a, a concept of th what roasting does these days to wood, right? It's that same type of thing. You're trying to get it to lose that moisture that it wants to hold on to, bake it out, force it out, creates a more stable piece of wood. Yeah. It's going to be stable now. It's going to stay stable long. It's not going to react as much to climates. So that that science goes all the way back to these violin makers. All you know, everybody had their way of their time of achieving that. So that's impressive. See, so, this is why we brought Bill Bill Nye, the Terry guy, on here. I there's a question in the feed that I kind of love. Where is it? Right here. I get this. I hear this one all the time. Oh, why why are uh, 90s tailors so sought out is a good question for terry why do you why do you think people are seeking out 90s tailors these you days? know that's that's a that's a super interesting question because you have there is the way how we built guitars previously was all the way up to like 98 99 when the nt came in so You've got two different versions of 90s guitars. But the 90s, I, th I, think, a, I think a bit of that is psychological. That's what Mike was talking about earlier here. Because the 90s was when everything took off for us. And Nancy Griffith was a part of that because... That took, we took off in Nashville. Now all the Nashville players are using their guitars. They're recording with them. They're playing live with them. It just went crazy, right? So that, that 90s was that era where, for us, where everything took off like a rocket ship. And all those models we made were the ones that, you know, Alan Jackson and Clint Black and Kathy Matea and, the list just goes on and on and on of those people. They were all using tailors 
<clears throat> and they were all 90s guitars. So I think I think there's a bit of romanticism going on there with the 90s and what happened for us in the 90s, the players that were using them, and the fact that just about every single Nashville record that you hear from the 90s is a Taylor guitar on it. I'd say 90%. That's crazy. I love it. So that. I think that's part of it. Yeah, I would agree. I would I mean, and just like we talked about earlier with, you know, I, I the idea that, you know, like guitars, guitars do open up. We've been talking about this a lot. And break in. So open yeah, up. they break in, they open up. So, you know, a guitar from the nineties is is now, you know, depending on what year of the nineties is thirty some, some years old. Right. So it's opened up a significant amount, you know, like so those guitars are going to sound, you know, pretty good. Right. But there's, I think you're right. There's a, there's a certain amount of the, the kind of cultural thing where people, people um, assign value to specific eras of things for yeah, whatever reason. Guitar players do it all the time. We kind of fetishize yeah. this year of this thing is the golden era of it. And it's like, is it though? Well, like, we wa we watched the fifties take off. We've watched the sixties take off. The seventies have taken off, and we're even starting to watch eighties guitars take off. Just in the marketplace, by sheer age, uh, do they sound better? Yeah, that's that's a subjective thing. I'm sure a lot of them sound a lot better. You know, a big and part some of, of them too don't, is, and, yeah, and some, some of them, them don't. don't. Right, but a big part of that too. You know, somebody, somebody, uh, somebody in the in the chat is asking. You know, the different difference between the sound variation between a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand dollar Taylor. You know, I think that's a great question. the The answer is it's a law of diminishing returns. You know, after you get past a certain point, you're no longer paying for the woods of the sound. You're paying for either the rarity of it or appointments or what have you, and that's what goes along with a lot of these older guitars they're not making any more 1959 les pauls they stopped around 1960 right <laughs> right <laughs> you know in fact they start they stopped january 1st 1960 well yeah they the night making 59 les pauls yeah so, a 1960 is way different than a 59 exactly so they're designed differently they stopped making them i i just i had to look it up just because i didn't remember the number but in 1959 there was 643 Les Paul standards made, all right? You got to think that a bunch of them are gone now and every other one is accounted for. Though there's a, you know, mm -hmm. something under the bed that pops up once every 20 years. You're just like, I didn't know about that one. But they're not $500,000 because they sound like a $500,000 guitar. They're just rare, you know? You know. And there yes, are bad are. ones and there are good ones. Yeah, and I worked, uh, I worked on four of them last week. As you so said, there you go. Yeah. And there's bad ones and good ones. You know, it's really interesting. I, I love this, uh, these subjects about it, 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 everything. It, it comes down to it's subjective. It's do you like it or not? I was with Andy Powers mm -hmm. at Chicago Music Exchange and they took us up to the vault and they play and he pulled out two like 50s, I don't know the years, strats. And one of them, you saw Andy just gush. And it was like, he's a great player. He's playing. He's just in love with this. He's like, wow, you can feel that. You can hear the angels in this guitar. And <laughs> then he put the other one in his hand and he started playing it. And they were both like, I, I think the price tags on these things were north of 60 grand. Okay. So then he plays the other one and he's playing it. And you could see it on his face. He was, his body language was totally different. And it was like, Meh. and as we were walking down the steps or whatever, he's like, eh. the first one was great. And that's all he said. And it was like, they might've been within a year or, or two of each other. So it's not apples to apples, but it's close, right? Sometimes it is subjective. I, I got a couple of questions for you guys. Then I'd like to dive into some of these questions on the feed. Mike, do renowned musicians and guitar experts generally prefer old guitars over new ones. Why or why not? Um, yes, they do, mainly because they've been playing those same instruments for years. In a lot of ways. I mean, you know, 
it, I, I would say it's kind of split between they've been playing those guitars for years and that's what they're used to. And they're old now. So the guitars are old <laughs> and some of the hype, right? You know, let's talk about somebody like a, like a Joe Bonamassa who has like every rare guitar ever made. Right. right. He, he loves them. He takes care of them. He's an expert in them. His father, you know, was, uh, had, you know, started that whole thing with him. But he buys the ones ago. he likes too. But he buys the ones he likes. Right. You know, Kenny Wayne Shepherd, he's another one. He really yeah. likes vintage guitars. And I, uh, I had a store that was actually, they had a 1960 Les Paul that they were going to go and have him, you know, take a look to purchase. I played it. Guitar was amazing. I thought at least he passed on it because he said it just wasn't the right one. And, you know, there's, it doesn't matter what it is or how old it is. It's got to be the right one. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you've ever seen, Ken, if you've ever seen Kenny play is, is, his Fender Strats, he, he, he plays them so hard. It's like, he hates them. Right. So yeah. Right. Right. Those are his stage guitars. And then you have his other guitars too, you know, that is in, in, in the collection, but it's a collection for a reason. You're collecting for the rarity, for the, for the, loftiness that we have created uh in as as guitarists you know the reverie that we've placed on these instruments you know because they are rare and again you're not having like a 1954 fender strat is not being made today right. they'll make one in the custom shop but it's not from 1954 right i played the first production 1954 strat ever it was, was it cool. Good? It was cool. I've heard better. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? And you've heard better that are newer, which is exactly. Also, yeah. So, but was the guitar like amazing to hold because of the story and the historic value of it? Hundred percent. Did it sound like a billion dollars? I don't think so. You know, not to me. You know, I've heard better strats and I've heard better newer strats. So again, it's, you know, yes, they prefer it because that's kind of like what they're used to in a lot of ways. Like let, let's talk about Blackie, you know, Eric Clapton's famous Blackie. That thing had more necks on it than you could believe. Yeah. yeah. That thing, that thing was, was, was a Frankenstrat. It was the, it was the origin of Frankenstrats. Forget about Eddie Van Halen. You know, you got Eric Clapton just changing necks right and left because his tech would change them out for him or whatever. He found a neck he liked better or just... You know, it's just what he liked. It wasn't necessarily like this particular year was the one. He yeah. played something that sounded good and then or felt good to him. And then he made it sound incredible because he's Eric Clapton. Exactly, so. Robert. Exactly. And that's that's a lot of what, where we're going with this. I got a couple yep. more questions. Terry, this one's for you. Can the craftsmanship of older guitars significantly significantly affect their sound quality compared to modern manufacturing techniques? uh <clears throat> yes it can yes it can um and yeah the craftsman who built it who did the work on it yes it can matter on whether the guitar is good or a little bit funky okay now first you've got those pieces of wood that that craftsman has in his hand are those going to make magic or are they not no matter what he does right just because he's a master craftsman Maybe those two pieces of wood aren't getting along and that guitar didn't make a good marriage, right? So you've got that in the first place. But then you've got the workmanship, just the details of, say, uh, just how the frets went into that neck, which matters a lot, you know, if you don't get into that with Eric Johnson. Because uh, just installing the frets, how tight did they go into the slots on that neck? What batch of frets was that? Did, they, did everything seat in there really nice? Did they go in there nice and tight? That's a big part of the resonance of a guitar. Just the frets installed into the fingerboard make a big difference, right? So, and, and then, you know, this, the setup is gold, of course. But, you know, Mike's talked about the pickups, the pickups that went into that guitar. The Craftsman's, he's kind of slave to a lot of what he's given. And then he does the best work he can do between the setup, maybe between the fretting, the nut, the whole thing, all these things to get the most resonance he can possibly get out of that guitar. 
but a lot of it is up to mother nature the pickups the winding on the pickups which could always be different back then you know it, it there wasn't it wasn't like some exact uh, digital number of wines it's like oh i wound it till it was full yeah, they didn't count right. up to you know? 5,000. Right, they didn't. Yeah. Right. So right. can the craftsman make it? This one looks good. <laughs> yeah, but he's but he's dealing with a lot of stuff that landed on his bench that he decided to make that guitar out of, unless he's the guy that picked out the piece of wood, picked out the neck. But even, yeah. uh, even then, you could pick out the best pieces of wood there are. That guitar is going to be amazing. It's going to be beautiful. Is it going to be the best sounding one? That's subjective, and it depends on are those pieces pieces of wood going to make magic or are they not? Just like the 59 Les Pauls. They don't all sound great. They don't, right. Yeah, I love it. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, such a, it's such a, you know, a push and pull conversation. Like we, also, got, we definitely have some people who are bummed at this conversation, right? They come in and they're like, Oh, oh yeah. Old guitars are the only way to go. Yeah. Uh, we're killing it for them. Isn't for it, them. Isn't it also like fair to say that, you know, when those old guitars were being made, those people were using the, the best tools and techniques they had at the time. At the time. Things have changed. We had, you know, invented science and stuff since then. And, you know, like, <laughs> There, there are some things that we can do now, like Terry saw behind him, that that we necess couldn't necessarily do before, which allow us to be a little more consistent in how the guitars are made and some of those parts are made. And, you know, there was a period in the 70s where Gibson was putting plastic bridges on acoustic guitars and like they thought that was going to be a great idea. I'm excited for when those come become big in the vintage market. That's going to be an <laughs> interesting time. Um, hey, I'll put... Bakelite bridges on acoustic guitars for a while there. Um, but like, you know, the, those things over time, like there's been pretty drastic changes. Like we're talking about with, with various guitar companies, Fender and Gibson, even, even within the same like decade or whatever, the, the shifts mid production of things or the slight differences. And that's one of the things about like the Taylor, I've always kind of admired Taylor has always been about like, okay, well, can we make it better? Can we make it a little better? It's not, not, right. not grabbing onto one thing and going, well, it's the traditional way. So we're going to only do it this way. It's like, can we do this? Is there a way to, to solve this problem or make this, this a little better? And, and I think that's an interesting thing. It's kind of baked into the ethos of the company. It's always been that way. It's well, we're never satisfied. Hey, uh, look, trouble. I was going to say, Terry, my most favorite. We're always frustrated. We're never satisfied. Yeah. My most favorite thing is when, like, Terry gets in arguments with people over, like, one thousand, one one hundred thousandths of an inch. He'll be like, no, it's one hundred, one one hundred thousandths of an inch off. Like, like the, the amount of detail that goes into our production and our, our, our development, product development, et cetera, is incredible. We couldn't do that. That couldn't, that wasn't done a hundred years ago necessarily. Cause like Gabe said, they were using the tools that they had. So it's a little bit different. Modern is as modern does. It becomes more modern. The more technology research and energy we put into how to make these things. We always hear Bob tell stories about, I used to work two days a day. I would build guitars all day long, go home, eat dinner with Cindy, and then come back to the shop and make a tool to make the next guitar easier to build. So modern day manufacturing bob yeah. taylor has crushed it he's just done that and interestingly terry's been here for a lot of that trip All right well, Gabe, I... yeah the machinist it was a we have a lot of a machinist mentality of how we go about things and bob's one of bob's big loves was machines even going back to being a kid just as much as guitars so there you go yeah, I, I I love it. All right, I got one last question for the guys on the screen here, and then we'll we'll dive into some questions over over in the feed, and then we'll wrap this thing up. Gabe, this one's for you. Are there any myths or misconceptions surrounding the idea that gold, old guitars inherently sound better than new ones? That's a clarifying question for if they if people just jumped into the feed right now and started watching. I I think there are tons of them. I think 
what you just heard in those three guitars, my playing aside, the how alike and yet how subtly different they are should kind of answer that question for you. Um, you know, those are there's 40 years between a, a very big spread of guitars from, you know, the, the 79 510 when Taylor was really making guitars by hand. I mean, that's, that's a really handmade guitar. And when you hold it and you feel it and you, you see the shape of it and the headstock carved, like you, it, it's, you can tell, you know, that logo was cut out with a jeweler saw to a, to a 2018, you know, builder's edition 517, which is, you know, tons of, of factory production and stuff in there and lots of tech going into the, the build quality of it. But the spirit of the guitars is really consistent throughout in terms of, you know, they also have a, have a certain vibe. It, it, it ebbs and flows a bit. It changes some over the years, but you know, I think that the idea that something is inherently better because it's old, I think it's, I don't, I don't like to just dismiss things out of hand but to me, I, I don't think you can fairly say that that a guitar is in, is going to be inherently better because it's old. I've played, God, I don't know how many vintage guitars, you know, through my years as a retailer, loads of 50s, 60s, 70s acoustic guitars. And there were probably one or two that I really wanted to take home ever and went, this, this, this is a great guitar. Like that I just... You know, if man, if I if I could put another, you know, enough scratch together to take this one home, there are probably a couple. I know there was a there was a guild that I really wanted at one point. There was a fifty one J forty five that was really cool, but like there there aren't that many that to me are super memorable. That they're just like better than everything else. Um, I think old guitars are cool, like Mike said, because they're not making them anymore, and there's a history. You know, as guitar nerds. We really like the 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 history of things and the you know the the history of the way that you know like like Terry was talking about you know how, how Nashville kind of exploded in the nineties. There there's a certain history baked into instruments that people have had them, the records they've been used on, the things they've been used for, and and I think we kind of fall in love with that. We fall in love with the romanticism and the the story of the thing. Yeah. And, and I think that's kind of how that, how those things get valued more than like, Oh, it's better. Like it was, they were made better. Well, I don't really think most of them were, to be honest. But you yeah. know, Gabe, Gabe, to your point, it's, you know, we, we, the romanticism, I mean, that's just the word I was searching for, for the past like five minutes, like for what I want to crystallize <laughs> a point. And you said it was perfect because, you know, we, we like to have that, you know, that charm of, of a handcrafted, you know, acoustic guitar, craft and, beer, you know, and, and every, well, it's, that's why this craft in the word craft is in everything now, including yeah. cheese or artisan craft cheese. Um, I'm, I'm know, a little artisan, bit artisan, artisan for bread. That. The bread is artisan. Was there I'm somebody at, cobbling in the flour? This is no. a craft podcast. I'm a little it responsible. It is very much a craft podcast. I'm a little <laughs> responsible for craft for, <laughs> For craft artisan cheese. I'm, there I may you have go. Made craft, that you, yes, you you did play a part. Well, in there was there was craft cheese, but it there began, was. Like, we, it's we not began, it began with a K. It's not the same. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Any, all right. Anything with a K is bad. But the point I'm trying to make is that you know we we we're, we're conditioned. We were conditioned that handmade is better, and then production and not Taylor, but production in general didn't do itself any favors as you enter the 70s and 80s of guitar making in a lot of ways. Sure. You know, we have the Norlin era of, of Gibson, which was, you know, kind even though poor. those guitars are rising in value now, it's because there's none of them left, not because they were a golden age of Gibson's Luthery. You know, you think about, like, even Martin started making electric guitars in the early 80s. You're like, uh, uh <laughs> what's going on here? And then you see, like, a lot of things that came out of Asia, that um, uh, quality control was not at the top of their list. It's miles better than it was 15, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago in a lot of instances. So, 
you know, that's we we've, we've been conditioned that, well, if it was older, it was done better because it was done by more people and people looked at it and cared. You know, if you think about like cars, think about Chrysler in the late 70s and early 80s. Right. Or like anything made by Ford around 78, you know, any of that stuff <laughs> is, you know, like the Mustangs, they call them Rustangs because you could put your feet through the floorboards because they bought cheap sheet metal to make the cars so we have this sort of thing like it's the same thing with cars like oh like a 64 and a half mustangs like the best like you want that one you know or a 67 or something like that because it was made better you know it yes in a way because they didn't cheap out on the parts but does that make it a better car you know was it more efficient was it better for emissions right it probably wasn't right but we have this this romanticism about older things. We fetishize old things. We do, 100%. So romanticism, that's such a great word to, to kind of crystallize that. Thank you. Romanticism. That, I do, I do maybe, before we wrap this thing up, maybe want to play those videos again, back to back to back to back, yeah. so we can hear all three of them together. But there's a question that we even brought up when we were doing pre-production for the show, fellas, and that is... This right here. Is it true that an old guitar that's been played often actually sounds better than one that sat in its case the whole time? Terry, how do you feel about that? Okay, well, you, you've got that subjective words going to come in here again, <laughs> right? It's yeah. Because you're, we've almost answered that in 20 different ways, this whole thing. Is it true? Yeah. Well, okay, a guitar that's been played more it's been vibrated more. It's been through more things. It's probably been through more climates. It's been through more stages, hot stages, cold. It's been in cold. It's been in hot. The thing's been through hell, you know? And uh, so is it likely that it could sound better from being broken so well? It's very well possible. And that could be very true. You could say that's true, but then You've got some guitars uh, like uh, you've got. OK, I'll make a case in point. You've got some 59 Les Pauls or I played a, a 1960 Les Paul last year that my buddy owns. Right. These guitars are in pristine condition. They've they're under the bed guitars. Right. Yeah. Grandpa, Grandpa played it a handful of times in the bedroom, the things and crazy good condition. It sells for 5 million guitars. Well, that guitar just happens to sound this 1960 I played last year that looks like new. That thing is unbelievably remarkable how it sounds. I mean, I was like, whoa, okay, this is just about the best Les Paul out of 100,000 that's come through my hands. It's hardly been played. So it's that whole thing we've been talking about, Mother Nature, those pieces of wood, the magic that it made. That guitar sounded killer when it was made, when it was done. It didn't need to be played, right? That's can happen with an acoustic guitar now. It can happen with an electric guitar now. Doesn't need to sit, doesn't need to be played a thousand times. There's a lot of guitars that are brand new that can sound phenomenal, Yeah. right? So it's a loaded question. It really is. It's you can't just make a blanket statement and say, oh, it's been played off and it sounds better. Like the, some of these guys come out with all these little things that vibrate the guitar. You know, you hook it to your guitar and it vibrates it for a month or whatever you want, however you want to hook it up to your guitar for. OK, could it make the guitar sound better? Yeah, maybe it can. Maybe it can. Genius but, you know, marketing, though. But, oh, well, totally. but, you know, there's a guitar sitting in the corner that's not gotten any love that could blow its doors off after it's been vibrated for a year. Man, You've got a lot of factors that come into guitars, whether they sound good or not. And just use your ears, pick it up, see if it sings. I do think I, I, that, uh, you know, doing those, you know, putting it in front of a speaker and all these other things, whatever, you know, I think that if you have a guitar that's under the bed, not played for 20 years and a guitar that was played for 20 years, right. It would sound, I don't know if better is, I think that's probably the word we shouldn't be using. 
if a guard, if a guitar's been played for 20 years, obviously we know it goes through changes. Like Terry, like you said, it's gone through hot, it's gone through cold, it's gone through humidity, right. it's gone through dry, all that. It will sound different. Different. Different yeah. is the word. Yeah. Better is now a point of subjective, yeah. of being subjective. But will like, it sound different? Yes, that's objective yeah. because it's gone yeah. through its changes. It will right. sound different. Different. Will it sound better? Good. That's a great word. That's, and a, like that's the, a really good word. We should like, romanticize the different, word different. different. Like that Leo, like the Leo Cocky guitar I talked about, yeah. right? Yeah. The thing sounded amazing. One of Don't his favorite it. guitars, right? But it was abused to death. <laughs> you wouldn't want your guitar to look right. like that. I, I like, have a it's like Smokey Joe, man. It's like Steve Polk. Oh, <clears> oh god. <throat> oh boy. Oh yeah. It, that Steve, old that perfect. old 710 is the worst <laughs> beat up crazy got a forklift through the lower bout thing yeah. in the world and we forced yeah. him there's a story where we <laughs> tim godwin forced him to take a 517 or a 717 or something like that just to have a companion and he fell in love with it he I, fell um, in love with a modern yeah. round-shouldered andy's mm -hmm. take on a round-shouldered dreadnought with a torrified top and a rosewood back inside it just made sense that guitar made sense for him so he's got this old you know 90s beat up Frankenstein, and then he's got this this other guitar, and he loves them both. But sorry, I cut you off, Terry. I I have a really good answer from Andy from a few years ago. I emailed him to ask him. Um, somebody was asking about about those vibration things in the Taylor Guitars owners group that that I have, and he uh, uh, it's a, he wrote me this totally very Andy thorough explanation of everything. <laughs> There's but a twenty five thousand word dissertation. It's, it's on long. It. It's really long, but it's super cool. And it, and I was He's so great. He was talking about the difference between that and like roasting tops, but he um, it's funny because a lot of what Terry and Mike are saying is really really in tune with what Andy said in twenty nineteen when he wrote this. Um, and I'll just read a, a, a like two sentences. He says, it's helpful to understand what we want from a guitar. As a player, I want the pleasing, accurate musical vibrations that allow me to play songs. At the same time, I want to reject or remove non-musical sounds, which might interfere with this. More of the good musical sound is good. Less of the bad inharmonic sound is good. More of everything isn't necessarily better. And then he goes on to say a little bit later, vibrating a guitar in a way inconsistent so with how a guitar is played will certainly loosen it up, to use a common term, but doesn't do it in the exact same way as a guitar, which develops a preference for playing common notes from his fingerboard. So he's saying like, by the way, that was just a couple of sentences. Yeah. It's like getting a book. It's so great though. But, but he's very much saying like, sure. Well, one of those tools like loosen something up. Yeah, it can, but is it going to do it in the same musical way as time and playing it? No, probably not. Like, just because it sounds, it's just like in the recording studio when um, something is mastered. Yeah. It gets louder and people automatically go, oh, wow, it sounds so much better. I can't believe it. And it isn't necessarily better. Sometimes it's just louder. Like you you have to actually like turn a fader down and listen to the master. Sometimes you know, like, it gets worse. Sometimes it gets worse. You need to right. actually listen to it with the volume set the same to know if it's better. Well, in a lot of guitars, <laughs> I mean, the reality of the guitar, people use it as a tool of the trade. They're, you know, they're these pro players. They don't baby that thing. Yeah. They give it no, hell. They beat it up. That yeah. guitar's been through hell. They give it hell, right? So a lot of the reason that guitar sounds so good is it's been abused and it's been through everything you can think of, right? And so there's no vibrating machine is going to recreate that. If there yeah. was, every guitar player would be, would yeah. be every every guitar company would be using that. If it really, <laughs> you know, like why wouldn't they? Um, here's a, here's a question we got a while ago. How how much does age of an acoustic guitar contribute to its sound compared to setup strings, etc.? This is a really good question. It's a really good question. Anyone want to take that one? I think. When you listen to those those three guitar clips, the you know if if you put 
the brand new exact same strings on those three guitars. I mean, they're all set up well. They all play great. So, you know, the the argument I would make when you listen to this pl- clips, and I know Jason said something about playing them back a, a little bit ago, but is the difference between them isn't so extreme that you automatically go, oh, that old one's way better. You know, like it's not it's not that big. It's it's more of like taste. It's more right. of like, oh, that you you season this one slightly different. It's not so massive. And in the likelihood that the different the differences between them are more, you know, like was Mike was saying, because of the body shapes or because one's got a cedar top, than because one is old. Like well, yeah. Set up, you know, strings, that stuff matters, I think, there, a lot. There I mean, is there is something I need to add on this one that's ooh. real, real important to know. The setup will change the tone of your guitar. Right. It will change it. Right. Because uh, and here's a great example. Back in the 90s, when we were coming in there, you know, fast and hard, a lot of the times, you know, some bluegrass guy, he would buy a Taylor guitar. Our guitars were a little more sparkly, didn't have as much low end. Right. They were just this real even thing that we talked about Nashville recording. And. So for those guys, I'd say, oh, you want it to be louder. You want it to be bassier. You want to drive it harder. I go, okay, I can do that. And uh, there was an old commercial that I used to bring up. I used to to call it one hour Martinizing, for lack of another term, because I would set the angle different on it, more like an old Martin, right? So therefore, the angle would be lower on the guitar, the action would be higher. And so what happens is now that guitar, because of the setup, now you have to a little, be a little more manly in your playing because it's going to be harder to play, but you're going to get more volume out of the guitar, more bass out of the guitar. And many bluegrassers would call me up and go, what'd you do? How'd you do that? I said, well, I lowered the angle, <laughs> the, pitch of the, the pitch of the neck to the body, now you have higher action. It drives the top more. It vibrates the top. It makes the body move more. You're getting more volume. You're getting more bass. The setup literally will change the sound of your guitar, depending on what you want or your action preference. You know, if you can handle a little higher action, you can get more out of that guitar. It's just like, um, Terry, I know you can attest to this, but we talk a lot about um changing neck angle on, on Taylor's being such a massive asset. Um, whereas on a lot of traditionally glued in guitars, the very first thing Tex will do if you have high action is file the saddle down and, and you get these guitars in your shop and the, the, the saddle is filed down to almost nothing, you know, and, and they don't, they don't sound good because you, you there's no everything. break angle. You yeah. lose everything. Yeah, yeah. The guitar just loses everything. I love this. All right. I'm going to play those clips back to back to back real quick, and then we'll vote on our favorite guitar. You don't have to vote. I'm just kidding. But in the feed, I'd love to hear your opinion. What guitars do you, which one of these three sticks out as your winner for tonight? Uh, In the spirit of our battle of the brackets, I don't know if you know this, if you go to our Instagram, uh, if you follow us on Instagram, we are, we have a challenge going on right now. It's called battle of the brackets in the spirit of March madness. You can win a 50th anniversary 314 CE limited. So you should all go find that. I think it's also on our website somewhere. Um, you should join that. And if you're in for the running, it's very simple. We have a bracket of guitars and you play them against each other and vote. All right. So let's, let's listen to these back to back to back starting at 79. Then we'll go to 2005. Then we'll go to ni- uh, 2018. Here we go.
Yes, that was a camera, Gabe. Yep. <laughs> my favorite is hearing my kids yelling at the end of that one. <laughs> uh, all right, for me, I, for me, I think they were all great. But if I'm buying a guitar out of those three, I'm buying the five seventeen. Mike, hmm. I really kind of like the five ten. Awesome. Yeah, because I like the 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 fullness that that one had, but. I'm sure it would be a bear to record with. Absolutely. Terry, what are you choosing? I'm really torn between the 510 and the 517. And for a lot of, I, I love that full rich sound I'm hearing from the 510. Love it. And I also like the, uh, I like the stronger mids of the 517. So I'd uh, I'd be trying to marry the two of them together, but uh, it's it's almost dead even for me on those two because they they're both going to do exactly what I need them to do. Yeah, we're going to walk in tomorrow, and Terry's going to have the five thirteen and a half. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Gabe, Wait. you don't you don't get to vote because they're your guitars. I'd love I don't to... have to choose; I have them all. I know. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love how everybody's. Hey, Tex wins. 1974 <laughs> yeah we love oh, it Tex. Boy. all right all right you know what time it is mike you know what time it is mike it is time it is time for mike's question terry uh, mike's question is where he asks you a question and uh we don't know what it what it's gonna be so enjoy hmm. yourself okay so here we go and we can all take a round at this as well now terry we all know you're a fabulous guitar player and uh, you're in, I think, more than one Rolling Stones tribute band. Um, but I want to know for the group from Terry first, of course, if you were to do like if you wanted to start your own tribute band, obviously not the Rolling Stones. What other band would you want to have a tribute band with or a four? I should say. Ooh, so good. Uh, boy. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Um. I think what would be really fun just for that combines soul, R&B, soul, R&B, rock, would combines the whole thing. Um, the, the band I would do that uh, wouldn't sell tickets in a tribute sense <laughs> uh, would be Humble Pie. But it ah, would be awesome. It'd that be, would be, be Humble it, Awesome. It would be humble pie, and uh, and uh, I'd probably put the Allman Brothers right behind that. That's wow. a good question, Gabe. What's your answer? Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, greatest American songwriter of all not, time. Not Dave Matthews. Opinion. No, that's a that's a. I mean, I I love Dave Matthews Band. They're a great band. That's a band that absolutely just doesn't need a cover band. I don't think. Like I mean, they exist. They exist. I I don't see the. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty unique sound. I don't see the point. Like, I don't think I could do anything with that. You know what I mean? Like, I, where do you go? But Heartbreakers, man, like, that'd be so fun. I like Jar Daria's covers are good of Dave Matthews, I guess. Daria's unique. She does her yeah. own thing. I don't think I could do anything with it. Daria's covers. I could listen to Dave Matthews if it's Daria. <laughs> So if it was Daria Matthews, the Ooh. Daria Matthews, Dave Matthews tribute band, I might be able to listen to that because her renditions of those songs are, 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 are it's like, you know, it's like a satellite in the sky. They do share the same initials. Yeah. I love this. Anyway. Okay. Uh, Mike, what's your answer? You know, I didn't really have one for myself, but I probably would have a lot of fun being in a faith no more tribute band oh man oh that would be cool i think Dude. that would be a lot of fun because you get to play all different styles of music in one night you can play you know like pop rock you can play metal you play funk you, you play lounge because they just span all of that so i think that it's would be true. a lot of fun to do dude did i ever tell you the time that mike Patton was on my couch when i woke up in the morning what yeah it was totally random when i lived in philly there was a, 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 I lived with Brian Benoit, who used to play guitar in Dillinger Escape Plan. 
Dillinger escape plan. He had three or four carpal tunnel surgeries from playing in that band and then had to forcefully quit the band. They got another guitarist anyway. But that was when they, Dimitri, they had fired Dimitri, the original singer, and they were trying to find a replacement and they couldn't find one. <laughs> and I was working, I worked at a, a bar, like a, like a bar back at a venue. And I, I came home one night, just went to sleep and woke up and there was a dude on my couch and I went to make coffee and it was Mike Patton. Like, I want to very. What random. are you doing? I want to anyway. start a Dexy's Midnight Runners uh, cover band with you guys. So we'll play the one song. That's it. That's it. Just the one. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> we'll just play "Come On Eileen" and then walk. Yeah. Thank Daria, you. Can, Daria can. Daria can do it. She can yeah. sing it. All right. Fine. I Terry, love that question. That was a good question, Mike. Terry, do you have a favorite Stone song to play? Uh, to play, yeah, the uh, I'd say, uh, uh, can't you hear me knocking and monkey man? <clears throat> monkey man, can't you hear it? Can't you hear me knocking? It's got so much cool stuff going on in it, and monkey man's just a killer riff. And correct me if I'm wrong, you, you are Ron Wood in the band, yeah, yeah. Dude. Or, but you know, I have to do Brian Jones parts and Mick Taylor's parts and Ronnie's parts. So you got to try and combine all that together. And, you know, when we say Terry Myers is an absolute ripper, we mean Terry Myers is an absolute I know. ripper. I want to go find out tour dates so I can go. Giving me too like, much credit, but thanks. Dude, I want to hear him play on. like Beast of Burden and Loving Cup. I, and dude, it's so good. And he, where like he does he has ron down to like even the shoulder movement like it's so good anyway i love this uh all right well we would do two minutes of sports but we're running out of two minutes of time so two minutes of sports baseball season's back that's all we gotta say everybody clap baseball baseball's, baseball's back we're really excited about baseball um, Can't wait. good luck to your uh um, go guardians guardians isn't they were named after a bridge right something like that yeah bridge. so guardian bridge the most and cleveland then, thing ever and then uh uh mike good luck with your uh mets uh i hope they do well All this right, year listen as bad as things are i'm still a yankee fan you know i actually i posted <laughs> on facebook that news from spring training everybody on the yankees is injured <laughs> i saw players, that earlier I the players that. the coaches the trainers the start the uh, opening day is going to be the, the the lineup from the sandlot <laughs> yeah for sure i would go see that we lost but, our, we lost our manager we lost tito he retired alas i'm a tigers fan so yeah my nl team though, is everything. looking good my NL team, you know, the Giants, they always surprise people. I see your uh, Michigan State hat. I should have worn my Badgers hat. Yeah, my, my boys, my mom and I's boys. The, the, we won a lot of Big Ten championships this weekend. Yeah. But it was like in like cheerleading and gymnastics and stuff. And we won the Big Ten championship in hockey. I was really excited about that. Big Ten. The first time the, uh, the uh, uh, Michigan State Spartan hockey team has won the Big Ten championship. It was super dope. Now they're in the you know playoffs we'll call it the playoffs it's a tournament i'm excited but that's sports that's all we got ladies yeah, and gentlemen we just two did two minutes of sports yeah we just did two minutes of sports two yep. minutes curling canadian women are champs i know i love curling by the way it's so good yeah, cardinal fan it. hey robert we're trying to get uh, our, our boy best, adam wainwright on the show best actually. ball best ballpark Yes, get Wayno. We need him. Cool. Yeah, Wayno was here. Uh, I gave him a tour. He's a Taylor guy. So he has some Gibson stuff. He's got some vintage stuff, but he has a he has a couple of Taylors. And he 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 was playing in San Diego. They were playing in San Diego, and he wanted to come for a tour. And I introduced him to Mike. And Mike, <laughs> first words out of his mouth were, "Looks up at him and goes, wow, you're tall.'" And that was it. <laughs> and and Adam says, "Thank you." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it was. I, I'm a little so lost at that answer. Okay. <laughs> it was so good. Anyway, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, of course, ladies and gentlemen in the feed, you guys come here and you 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 bless us with your time whenever we do these shows. Uh, this was episode 99, and the next episode is going to be an absolute banger, as they say. Episode 100. I hope you guys are ready for what we have in store. It's going to be very, very, very exciting. We may have some people that you 
have met before on the show. Uh, we may rotate through a bunch of people. We may we just had our boy Bob on, but uh, we might have him on again. I don't know. We may have Andy on. I don't know. We're going to keep this one up our sleeves. We got a couple of really cool artists that are going to jump on. We have we have an exciting show in store for you guys. Stay tuned. Uh, I hope you guys get our emails. Subscribe to this channel. Like, follow, all that kind of stuff. We appreciate your time. We appreciate you hanging out with us. We are grateful for you. We do this because of you. Um, and it's also fun. I like to talk to these guys too. They're they're fun. Oh, Terry, it's been a, a joy to have you on, man. You are a wealth of knowledge and history, and it's exciting to straight up just hear your, you know, I that's why I gave you that science question, because I know how deep you get involved in the development of our guitars and making sure that our guitars are great. And uh, Terry does have a lot to do with that. So we appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, from best. from your home here in San Diego, Mike, tell Roger we said hello, Gabe. Thanks for playing those videos and making those videos earlier. Maybe it was yesterday and you just wear all the same clothes all the time. But no, it, was, wow. it was like an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we appreciate everybody. Thank you so much for another wonderful show. Somebody said that uh, they appreciated us and we, we appreciate you guys back. It's it, We do this because of this community that we've developed with you guys. So thank you so much. Uh, love you guys. Mom, it's been great to see you. I'll probably call you later. So pick up your phone. All right. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye, guys. See you, nerds. See Have you. a good Rock on. Hey, He's out. Bye, nerds. All right.